We're looking at Luke chapter 7, and we're going to be diving into a story of one of Jesus' anointings. Um, and, uh, and over the next couple weeks, I think we're going to follow that. Uh, the different anointing that Jesus had, there was uh, three different occasions where somebody came to Jesus and anointed him. And there was uh, a couple different lessons I think we can learn and we can glean from on, hey, what does that mean for us today? And so today we're going to dive in Luke chapter 7, and I want to read that starting in verse 36 this morning. So verse 36 begins this way, chapter 7 of Luke. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flax of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged right. Then turning towards the woman, he said to the woman, or said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. He did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we, we see this uh, amazing scene here. Jesus getting an invitation to the Pharisee's house. He got the teachers. They say, hey, come. And, and I would say, you know, what, what would this have been like in the day? And I was thinking, what kind of settings have I been to? I haven't been to any governor balls or any kind of like amazing, uh, prestigious places. You know, every once in a while, Rachel and I do enjoy to get, get all fancied up and maybe go to like a, they had an, in Missouri when we lived there, a chateau on the lake, you know, go spend like a hundred something dollars on a dinner just to say, hey, like, like that's a cool night. So we have done those kind of settings before, but this particular setting here, this is like a prestigious setting. Uh, there's the teachers of the law, this is a prestigious place, and Jesus gets this invitation to come here, and, and then in, in this setting of all these teachers, all these Pharisees, all this, all this, this nice thing going on, there, there's obviously uh, somebody who, who didn't belong. Like it, wasn't, it wasn't like a mystery that, okay, this, this lady that was here at the feet of Jesus, like that this wasn't the place where she, she normally attends, you know, sitting at the feet of, of the teacher, Jesus, or, or amongst the religious leaders at the time. It was a pretty obvious thing that was here. But what's also obvious as we look at the cultural, we look at the cultural norms, is that Simon, the leader of the, the home, he's like completely unimpressed that he has Jesus in his midst. How do we know that? Well, in verse 40, the 44 through 46, when Jesus is talking about everything that the woman has done for him, he said that, hey, she, she washed my feet, you know, she gave me kisses, she, she anointed me. This, this should have been done. Like, in any kind of uh, outlandish dinner setting like this, these things were without, like, this, this would have been normal, common practice. Just as if, you know, you guys come over to my house, or, or if I go to, over to anybody else's house, you meet at the door, you say hello, right? You take, right now, taking it off jackets. Like, there's a whole, 
I mean, we don't have it like written down, this is what we're supposed to do in the Midwest, but I mean, like, we know how to welcome people into our own home. And so, so for Jesus not to have received this kind of treatment when he entered into the home, it, it kind of shows like this kind of standoff this thing from Simon. He wasn't even concerned, he wasn't even grateful that the King of Kings is in his presence. <laughs> this kind of contrast was even it was magnified more by this lady, this this sinner. I just call her the sinner because I can say, man, every one of us can identify with that identity. It, the sinner was in the midst, and, and she knew what needed to be done. Verse forty nine was so powerful to me. This reflection that not only Simon didn't recognize who he was, but the whole room was puzzled at this common man. They had this perception of how Jesus, the Messiah, was supposed to come. And Jesus, he was just ordinary. He was just a simple man. But he walked and he talked in the authority and the power of God. And so they questioned even him at the very end of the story. They, they still don't get it exactly who this man is. They say in verse 49, who is this that can even forgive sins? Jesus calls them out for not knowing how much they had been forgiven. They had a room like that for the Pharisees. They had set up you know, you guys maybe have heard this before, but they set up laws upon the laws just in case they don't come close to the laws. And they had thought that by doing all these things and following all of these things rightly, that now they have a better standing before the Father in Heaven. But they didn't even recognize how much they had been forgiven, or, or how much they were in need of forgiveness. And we see that Jesus bringing this out in verse 47, when he does this, uh, compare and contrast is it between the one who has forgiven much of the 500 denarii and the one who had been forgiven the 50 denarii, right? And, and, and Simon kind of makes this statement, I suppose, I mean, man, I have an attitude. I, I have a hard time with that. When Denver goes, it forks me an attitude. He knows what the right answer is, right? And he's like, you know, I suppose. I mean, he's like, I don't really want to give you the credit for being right here, but I guess this is what the right answer is. This is kind of the attitude in which Simon responds to Jesus. He's like, he's like, I suppose maybe it's the one that has the greater debt that's been forgiven. But in verse 47, Jesus kind of really directly points out to them. He says, you who have been forgiven, forgiven little, love little. Jesus, surrounded by religious leaders, instead of being met by awe, was, not, was met with pride. He was met by people that thought that they had everything together. They didn't even know the one that they needed the most was standing in their presence. The one that they should be in awe of and, and, and should have been rolled out the biggest red carpet, done, done ten times as much as the normal greeting, was standing in their midst. When I'm thinking about this, man, I, I can't help but think of one lesson that we can learn. And one of these lessons that I have to believe we can learn today from this, this encounter where, man, all these people are, are surrounded by the very one that they need is that we should not allow our self-righteousness hinder somebody else's worship. So all of these people, they're surrounded, and Jesus is surrounded by all these people. That they should know exactly who this is that's sitting in front of them. And here comes this sinner that's going to lavishly love him and pour out upon him just this expression of worship and say, do you know who that is, Jesus? Man, it would be a shame if we allowed our self-righteousness to hinder somebody else's expression of worship. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a church that when, man, there's a sinner that's going after Jesus, man, I want to, I want to, Go, go for it. Right? Cheer them on. Get all that God has for you. Go close to Him, right? And yesterday we were talking in the uh, they were talking in the marriage conference. I was like, this is so cool because I'm like about to speak on this on Sunday. But when he was talking about the, the blind man 
And they said all around him there was people accusing him, like, oh man, maybe he sinned, and maybe it's the sin of his parents, right? And, and they were like, isn't all these things in Christ? Said, and Jesus said, no, it's for a demonstration of my power. Yeah. I couldn't help but, pe but, but want to encourage us as a church not to hinder people getting in contact with the very one that they need. Amen. Yeah. They didn't even know. This is the best thing that could have happened in this dinner. And uh, this is the best scenario ever that this sinner was able to have contact with the King of Kings, with the Lord of Lords, with the one who they didn't understand could, could forgive her very sins. A lesson and a warning to us. You know, even I was thinking about this, like on a Sunday morning, uh, just today, man, I, I've been guilty of this too, sitting in a, a sermon. And, you know, like, uh, it's a really good sermon, the pastor is going at it, and I think to myself, man, I wish so-and-so was here. This is me, I'm the only one that's ever said that, like, like they, really, they really need to be here to hear this word, right? That's the kind of attitude that these Pharisees, the, these Pharisees had, they were, they were so self-righteous, they thought of themselves, it, it is so right, that they had, they were trying to hinder this woman from going more than in worshiping the king, and getting her deliverance, getting the forgiveness that she needs, and it's a warning to us, it's a lesson to us, don't allow our self-righteousness to hinder somebody else's worship, but don't let our self-righteousness hold us back from receiving what God has for us. All these people around him need, in need of him. They weren't even impressed with him, but he's in the midst of them. And they, they, they missed the boat. They missed the opportunity. Yeah. Don't let our pride, don't let our self-righteousness hinder our worship. I wrote in my notebook. My, my notes are really small now. Sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. But I don't I don't ever want to be found guilty of not understanding what God has forgiven me. Right? That's what self righteousness is. I don't ever want to become so uh, confident in myself I forget how much I have been forgiven of. You know, they, they viewed this expression of worship. They, it, it, what's, what's really apparent is when even after Jesus has said, you know, it, those who, who have been given little, love little, they didn't understand how much they had been forgiven of. We have to understand, that we have to have this true belief, and I've said this before, but I mean, it meant because we were sinners, our, no matter what the sin is, right, we could, we could categorize it and say, okay, this, this lady in this setting had a worse sin, had a difficult sin, and she was a, it described, even the disciple, I think, even probably had some prejudices, because the way he wrote this, Luke, in his, in his thing, right, she was a girl of the city, she had, she had some problems, she was a sinner, right, that's the way he wrote it down, they, they don't recognize, they didn't recognize in this room, no matter what the sin was, now if, if they would have broken one of their little laws, or she would have broken some major uh, cultural taboo, either way, the, the, the final destination is the same. So we've got we to gotta really uh, hold on to that, really truly believe that, that hey, the condemnation, the, 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 the sentence, sorry, the sentence for our, our, our sins, the penalty for our sins is death, no matter what. And all of a sudden, they're, they're thinking, oh, I, I got greater sin, or she has greater sin, or I have less sin, and, and they, need, they need something more. No, we all are in desperate need of a Savior. what beautiful picture of the gospel is that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet messed up, if you didn't even know you were messed up, for Jesus, if you, even in Jesus, sometimes I still recognize I'm messed up, but, but while we were still messed up, Christ died for us. Christ came for us. I mean, I'm going to wait. That's going to get me a little excited. That's like, all right. We just go right back into worship now, right? Yeah. <laughs> And that's exactly what this woman did this, this moment. And she heard Jesus was in town. She heard Jesus was in town. She prepared her best gift. She wasn't going to hold anything back. Now, 
why is given why is even given finances why is given in time why is given in our talents to the lord why is it something because man when we recognize what has been done for us it's like there's nothing there's nothing too great for him to ask of me there's nothing that i can i mean like no god you deserve it all god you gave me life and this all of a sudden with this kind of revelation in her heart she prepares the best gift she has it wasn't half-hearted it wasn't it wasn't mediocre, it wasn't just the leftovers, it was the best thing she had, and this represents the love that she was shown. See, our, our gifts and our, our sacrifice represents our understanding, our belief, our faith in what Christ has done for us. In verse 41 through 43, we see this beautiful display of worship, this not withholding anything back, this understanding that she has been loved beyond what she deserved. She has been loved outlandishly and now preparing the best gift ever. Let's read this, verse 41. And there's a certain, uh, sorry, sorry, with that understanding, in verse 41, that this was what Jesus was saying. Hey, the one that has been forgiven more, man, there is much more love that to be shown. And, and then she goes into this expression when Jesus described it here, when I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet. But when she wet my hair, she, sorry, when she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, you gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Jesus, speaking to Simon, asked him that question again. I can't get away from that. He said, hey, which one do you think is going to love more? I suppose. I suppose. No. With confidence, I say, yes, the one that understands the greatness that they have been forgiven will outlandishly display their love for the king. I want to encourage us as a body, the second lesson that we can see here, is not to allow others' self-righteousness hinder your worship. So what? don't allow your self-righteousness to hinder somebody else, but don't allow other people's self-righteousness to hinder your expression of worship to the king. And people around you saying, "Oh, he, 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 don't don't do that. Don't 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 go that far. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. That's that's too much. He, God doesn't deserve that. He, do you know all the different ways that that would that would affect your life? Now, now I don't care. The, the, this woman enters this scenario where it's like a a, a governor's ball. It's like the, it's the cream of the crop. The Pharisees and G, and she's like, I don't care." What, uh, what, they, what they're going to think of me. I, I don't care what's going to happen to me. I know there's one in their midst that has forgiven me a bunch of, and I'm going to go all out for his same sake. I, I'm going to go all out and worship him. I'm going to get my hair messed up. I don't, I'm going to break all the cultural norms. I'm going to do, I don't care about it. I'm getting there. I'm going to worship him. I don't care what other people think about me. Amen. And when it comes to serving the Lord, when it comes to worship of our King, when it comes to what He asks us to do, and that's a kind of that's a kind of tenacity that we have to have. That's a kind of that's a kind of motive that we have to have. It, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to allow anybody to get in my way of getting what He has for me. Amen. From meeting with Him, and hey, we just went to the marriage conference. They talked a whole lot. A whole lot. I was thinking to myself, I said, man, going to a marriage conference, you would think maybe every marriage is terrible. Marriage isn't always terrible. I want to, I want to get that out there. It's not, it's not, it's a blessing and it's awesome. But yeah, there's sometimes it, it can cause some messes. It can get us in some messes. But you know, what, when they were encouraging everybody, everybody yesterday, is hey, get it out and get what God has for you, right? And, and I want to encourage us as a, as a church body the same way, right? Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever problem it is, what we know, and I will say it now, if you don't know, Jesus has the answer. Amen. Jesus has a solution. Jesus has a miracle. He has it. And so whatever the cost is, we must recognize like this woman did, it, there's my answer, there's my source, there's my forgiveness, there's my healing. And she did 
broke every norm that there should have been. He didn't care what the opinion, popular opinion was. He said, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna meet with him. I'm gonna worship him. And I'm telling you, if you're looking for deliverance, you say, Yeah, I want to get free from some stuff. And that's a, that that's the encouragement from this word. That's a, that's a lesson from this word that we can receive this morning. Go after it. Go after it. Don't allow the opinion of others. Don't let the self-righteousness of others. Don't let the pride of others get in the way of you saying, yes, God, I want all that you have of going after it. Right. You know? We, we took time in our marriage. Uh, oh, Rachel, another new pair of shoes. But anyway, um, <laughs> she always says, Andrew, you owe me $20, but you don't tell me I'm going to share, your, share my story. But, you know, we, we spent time at, as missionaries. And we were there, we got a sign there, we, we have our nice little credential cards in our pockets, you know, we, or something God ministered. And, and there was a season where God asked her to put down ministry so that she could, give, she could go after Jesus in the way that she was necessary. And that was hard to, to like say, oh, man, I'm here on a mission assignment, like this is what God wants me to do. And now God's saying, no, you know, I'm going to take a break from ministry so that I can receive what God asked me. I want to encourage you guys. You know, it may take it may take the season where, hey, you're going to have to go to some counseling. You're going to have to go get some deliverance. You're going to go have to have some some prayer. You're going to have to take a break from something in order to receive what God asked for you. It, no matter the cost, no matter the cultural norm, no matter what people are going to think of you, no matter what, it, go after Him. Go after him. Don't allow other people's opinions, other people's self-righteousness, other people's pride hold you back, hinder you from worship, from receiving all that God has for you. Pursue it. And as a church, I want to encourage us, we, we can't be in that boat. We can't be the, the people, the naysayers, all right? We've got to be people that are cheering people on. If they're, they're, good, if they're chasing after God, we've got to be people that, hey, let's be the ones cheerleading them on. Be like, hey, come on, go get it, right? Hey, I know somebody. I know that somebody you can go pray with. I want to be as a church, the people that are that are equipping and pursuing after all that God has from the deepest part of who we are. We've said this as a church for a while that we want to submit all of our life to the lordship of Jesus. That that takes some. That takes getting into some messy things sometimes. Then breaking some cultural norm. But you know what? It's going to happen. And when we do, we're going to receive all that God has for us. As we, as we see this, we also see in this picture, so we see from Simon and all these Pharisees this, this lesson that, hey, uh, that these righteous, or thinking self-righteous people withholding worship, we see this amazing expression of, of worship, but we also see Jesus in this picture. And I think when we look at Jesus, there's some things that we're going to see about who Jesus is, and I'm, I've been praying that this begins to transform our heart and transform some of our beliefs about who he is. Especially when it's in it, it, consideration to messy, sinful things in our lives. In verse 36, it says this, that the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I believe this is a significant starting point to this chapter. This story. I believe it's significant because we are we know what Jesus we, we already know the opinion Jesus has about the Pharisees. If we're looking through the New Testament, we, we already know he calls them brought of vipers, the, the whitewashed fins. He, he, I mean like if there's if, if there's an adversary outside of outside of the enemy, outside of the devil in the in, in Jesus' story, it's the Pharisees, it's the religious people that think they have it all in order. This lesson, this first lesson that we can see from Jesus, lesson three today, is this, that Jesus is willing to go to the self-righteous at the risk of receiving no worship. And I hope that kind of impacts you. That's this morning. Jesus is willing to go to the self-righteous at the risk of receiving no worship. He gets the invitation to go. And this is, this is something that, that I, I love about Jesus, right? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus is, is willing and has shown it over and over again and again in this story that he's willing to go someplace when he, he knows it is risky. 
I, I may not receive worship. I, I, they may not make me Lord of their life. I, I don't know what their response is going to be. But Jesus says, you know what? I'm willing to lay it all down for this. For this. I, I'm willing to lay it all. I'm willing to love. I'm willing to go. And, and so I, that's an encouragement, uh, encouragement to us that then over and over again we see Jesus going. Going to the place. Laying it down. Risking it. Uh, going all out on our behalf. Even to the point of death. And so, on this side of things, on this side, the Pharisees are all, they think they've got everything right. They think they've got everything in order. They don't understand the forgiveness that is necessary. You know, on that side of things, it's, it's magnificent to think that Jesus would go to those people. But then on the other side of, on the other side of it, I stand is, and maybe you stand with the reality of the way that your life is already messed up, right? You're thinking, well, yeah, that's great, Andrew. Yeah, but they were still, they're still pretty decent people. They, they still prepared a dinner for them. You know, they still had this nice house for them. They still had this place that he could recline. You know, there's some things that were going for them. And so, yeah, of course, Jesus went to their place. He took that risk for them. But it, then we see this greater picture that is put in this whole, this whole story. Jesus' interaction with this sinner. Jesus is not, even, not just willing to, to take the biggest risk and to, to go after the self-righteous, those that think they have everything all in order, but, but no, he, he interacts with a sinner. Verse 38 and 39, the people in the room, they, they were saying, if he was a prophet, he would know. He would know who she is. Maybe you've been in that boat. Like, you're thinking, oh, Jesus knows all the junk that I've done. Like, like, like I can't go before him because it's, it's too much of a weight. And there's people around me that know what I'm going through. And all of a sudden, i got this pressure on me. Like, like oh, they're going to they're gonna know. They're going to find out all these problems that I have. The beautiful truth about this picture that I see is that Jesus always accepts the sinner no matter the category of their sins. We've got, to, we've got to receive that word this morning. We've got to receive that word this morning. Right? Jesus always accepts the sinner no matter the category of the sin. So I know... Right, this is the amazing truth about Jesus is that, is that you know Jesus is a holy being. He, I mean, he is completely separated from my sin. He, man, he now sits in the throne room of God, interceding on my behalf, and 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 all of a sudden, as I maybe in, sometimes in my ignorance, sometimes you know. In, my uh, cultural ideas. I, I think about Jesus and I think about this holiness and this white throne and this, this, this holy place, this sea of glass, this fire and, and angels bowing down to him and elders declaring his holiness. And, 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 and it becomes this, like, this far distant thing that wants nothing to do with my ignorance. I, what if I bring and what if I tread my dirt and I my stuff and I just like that I just come into the, like I want to mess that up. But no, what we see here is this truth about Jesus. That though he is holy, though he is high and above, though he sits on the though he's interceding on our behalf, though he's in, in the heavens with the Father right now, he he comes to us. He meets us where we are. And this picture of this, this sinner coming to him and, and anointing him shows us that he, he's accepting of our worship. He's accepting of our mess. And it's not just accepting and saying like how gross of it. No, he, accept, he allows it to come close to him because what does he have to offer? And he turns to her at the very end in verse 47, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. 
And he said to her, he turns to her after confronting the, the Pharisees and, and their wickedness and their self-righteousness, their, their thoughts that they just have little something. He turns to her and he says, in verse 48, your sins are forgiven. I want to encourage us, like, no matter the mess, no matter the, the size of it, no matter what, this story demonstrates to us, man, Jesus allows you to get close to him. He, he doesn't want you to have it all in order. I, I mean, maybe he, he wants you to look like him. I, I should rephrase that. Right? He wants us to look like him. He, he, he's cheering us on so that we can be perfected in our faith. But man, when you are met, he, he, he doesn't face him. He doesn't reject that. ideas about what Christ enjoys and what Christ doesn't uh, you know, stop you from getting what he has for you. He's in love with you. While we were yet sinners, he already knew it was a mess. He took the risk already and he's willing to take it over and over and over and over and over and over again for us. And we would be forgiven that our lives would be made right in him. As we're examining this story this morning, we, we see, and I see it really firmly, don't allow your self-righteousness to hinder other people's worship. Don't stop other people from receiving what God has for them. Yeah. And don't allow others' self-righteousness, don't allow others' opinions to stop you from getting what God has, from, from, from God receiving the worship that, that you have. also see that, man, Jesus was willing to go to the self-righteous. He was willing to take the risk of receiving no worship. That speaks volumes about Christ's character, about Christ's love, about Christ's sacrifice to go. Even when he knew it was going to be a risky situation, even when he knew, man, these are people going to have to reject me, he still went to the house. And lastly, man, the truth that I want us to receive as a body the truth that I want us to, to run after, to, to receive, to, to block out all those lies that, that Jesus doesn't want us near him, that man, the Father isn't, isn't pleased with us and he's angry with us. No, Jesus always accepts the sinner, no matter the category of the sin. And I know people, I know, I know, I know you need to hear this this morning as a body. And I, I, I'm ready, you know, as much as we've been enjoying the presence of the Lord increasing on, on Sunday morning, and just this, like, just love, and just, you know, prayer times have been good, you know. Uh, what will hinder the continuation of God's presence in our life is, is the moment that we choose to stop where we're at, right? The woman, she was forgiven much, and she understood what she was forgiven, and, and she knew, hey, it's possible through the way the story is written that she was still in some mess. But she, she wasn't going to hold back. She got her greatest gift. She got, she got all out. She didn't care what the culture was going to say. She didn't care what the taboo she was going to break. I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going to worship as his feet. I'm going to give him all that he deserves. And, and you know what? In that moment, she received exactly what she needs. Amen. Forgiveness. So that's the opportunity for us as a church body. To continue a radical pursuit of God, no matter what other people's opinions may be, so that we can receive exactly what we need. And some of us in this room are saying, yeah, I need some forgiveness. Some of us in this room say, yeah, I need some restoration. Sometimes, some of us in this room, yeah, we, we say, I need some deliverance. I need, I need some God things in my life to be moved. And, and you know what? It, it, the, the only Say it kind of boldly. The only thing that is holding you back from receiving what, what God has for you is yourself. Is yourself. Go after it. Receive it. Man, Pastor and I, we're, we're here. We're here to help. We're here to equip. We're here to, man, let, make it happen. We got resources. If we don't, man, I'll, I'll go with you. I'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So that we can receive what God has for us. What God has for you. This morning I want to pray. And I want to invite us to respond to this word. God, I thank you this morning that you're speaking truth to us. 
God, you're reminding of us of truth, God. And Lord, I pray that faith would arise in our hearts to believe it. God, to chase after it, and to receive all that you have for us. God, I pray that you would forgive us for our self-righteousness. God, the ways that we have not pursued after you when we could have and we should have. God, in the ways that we've discouraged other people's pursuit and worship of you. But Father, in this moment, I want to make it all about pursuing you and getting all that you have for us. Father, like the, the sinner in this story, God withheld nothing, got the greatest gift, and just went after it. God, we want to receive all that you have for us. And so, Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, Lord, we would enter in as a body, a season of receiving all that you have for us. God, the deliverance, the forgiveness, the restoration, Father, the, the, the wholeness, uh, Lord, whatever it looks like, God, we want it. And Lord, I pray that there would be nothing that would hinder us from receiving it. God, not our own pride, not our own self-righteousness, not our own ideas, not the lies of the enemy. God, no, nothing that the enemy can cause, God, that would withhold us, would, would stop us from receiving your love, God, your holiness, Lord, your gifts. Lord, I pray do it now in our body, in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you say, yeah, Andrew, I, I, I need some prayer. I, I want to come after Jesus. This, this, this altar area, man, this is a time just to seek Jesus. This is a, just go after him. Just, just, just get all that you have. Just pray to him. And, and I want to be up here too. I would love to pray with you. Pray that you would receive all that God has for you. So let's take some minutes together and pray.